Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Judy, thank you. It is an honor to be here with you. Uh, the hardest working woman in show business. So I, I got to say, you, you're you awesome. I really appreciate that. And Susan Frazier's out there somewhere. Susan, where are you? There you are. Thank you, girl. She's my Scott County uh, coordinator here, and she's just doing a fabulous job. So thank you for all that you're doing. And Matt, obviously, uh, just getting to watch you and, and stand up for uh, for for Iowa and it is awesome. I mean, it's, so I told somebody that they said, "Man, what, what's that Secretary of State? Man, he's just he's just all over this uh, uh, first in the in the country." And I said, "Man, it's kind of like if you ain't for your home team, who you gonna be for?" Uh, so, Matt, thank you for the work that you've done, and I know the people of Iowa are very uh, very proud to have you and 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 the work that you do, and uh, to the local. Uh, senators and the, and the representatives, thank you all for coming out and for your public service, your sacrifice that you make. And uh, certainly these three individuals who uh, got up and shared with you their hearts about the future of this country, uh, the, the, the individuals that want to represent you in Congress, and, and um, they, they truly, they get it about what this is really all about from the standpoint of uh, nibbling around the edges is not going to work anymore. We're going to have to send people to uh, to, to Washington. They're truly going to make a difference. And I can see uh, all three of those ready to uh, walk into the room with maybe a sledgehammer and uh, get a little bit of work done. So, anyway, honored to have them up here. And, uh, you know, being here... Um, I'm always reminded when I show up in Iowa, you know, the, the pundits always think they're the ones that pick presidents. Nope. It's the people of Iowa that pick the presidents. I got that figured out. And I feel a special connection, as, as Brian was sharing with you, being the son of a couple of tenant farmers from back out in Paint Creek, Texas. And actually, Sandy, it wasn't a town. It, matter of fact, it was just a little community out there. and um, Small school. Uh, on a farm to market road, I had about 110 kids, grades one through 12, and a Methodist church and a Baptist church across the farm to market road. Your choice. And uh, and when as I was growing up, there were there basically Judy, there were three things that that I could be doing: going to school, which took up a good bit of time, or working at the farm, and you know being in the 4-H and showing club calves and what have you, or going to Boy Scouts. And and then mom made sure that I never missed a revival. So, uh, and, uh, uh, but our, but our teachers there at that little school, they lived around the, the, um, they, li they lived around the campus, Doc. They were, uh, had, had their own, I mean, it was just an incredible little community and a place to grow up. And, and it was, it was pretty humble beginnings. Um, and, and I'm, I will be forever grateful for that. We, we weren't rich. Uh, as a matter of fact, people would probably say, uh, we didn't have much materially, but we were rich. We were rich in things of faith and family. We were rich with great neighbors who took care of each other. I learned, unlike in a lot of Western societies, that opportunity wasn't granted to you because of your family name, but because of your capacity to dream, your willingness to work hard. You know, as Americans, we do not believe government exists to punish success in order to spread the wealth. We don't believe that. We believe government exists to protect our rights and to guarantee our freedom. I think Washington today has it all wrong. They punish success instead of multiplying it, Brad. They think the public sector can stimulate the economy when... That's the job of the private sector. They think the answer is to every problem, let's just add a new agency of government. And I can remember most of them. <laughs> and I, for one, don't believe the people that got us into this mess can get us out of it. Senator John DeMint or excuse me, Jim DeMint in South Carolina, I heard him say the other day, he said, are you better off today than you were $4 trillion ago? 
the solution is not to nominate someone who's going to nibble around the edges, as I said earlier. We're going to have to have people like these congressmen to be the walked in here tonight talking about bold ideas, about really making a difference. Washington doesn't need a new coat of paint. It needs a complete overhaul. You know, it's really interesting as I look across the country and as I've traveled a, a good bit since the middle of August, and, and um, the, um, America remains mired in the ruins of, of, of this Washington out-of-touch, big government economic policies. And, and, and when you go into Washington, D.C., though, and that surrounding area, they're doing just fine. It's really interesting. The fact, Washington metro area is now the most affluent metropolitan area in the country. And that's because all of those lobbyists, that's because all of those overpaid czars and bureaucrats haven't suffered one bit while we've been going through one of the worst economies that this country has ever seen. Main Street's windows may be getting boarded up, but the cash continues to flow to those Wall Street financiers, those Beltway profiteers. Now, tomorrow I'm going to unveil a plan to uproot all three branches of government and overhaul Washington. It touches every branch of government because they each have contributed to the demise of America. I'm going to address lifetime federal judges who arrogantly rewrite our laws from the bench. I'm going to address the permanent bureaucracy of the executive branch, which thwarts the will of the American people to advance a big government agenda. I'm going to put forward some very dramatic reforms for a Congress that not only spends too much, but is in Washington too much. The, <laughs> the question facing Iowans in 50 days isn't whether to embrace change, but to decide for them, Iowans, to decide who is the most credible me messenger of that change. Now, I'm the first to admit I'm not the most polished candidate out there. But let me tell you one thing, I stick to my principles. And those principles include a flat tax so simple you can file your income tax on a postcard right there. I'm betting even Timothy Geithner can fill this out and get it out on time. Those principles include creating a level playing field. That's why I'm for closing the corporate loopholes and carve-outs that these lobbyists and these tax lawyers have been exploiting to feed at that Washington trough. I'm the only candidate who has a plan to balance our budget by the year 2020. And with our nation, just as you heard John say a while ago, approaching $15 trillion in debt, I think any discussion of funding for foreign aid should start with the number zero. We will not fund nations who oppose our interest and harm our soldiers. That's just a fact. When it comes to protecting life, I offer more than just some pro-life rhetoric. I got a pro-life record. I signed a parental consent law for minors seeking an abortion. I signed a budget that defunds Planned Parenthood in Texas. And rather than bowing to the political correctness of the liberal elites, I led the charge in Texas to change, or I should say to define, Marriage is a sacred institution between one man and one woman. And we put it on the constitutional amendment and put it in the Texas Constitution. And I might add, Matt, just this last session, I was proud to sign that legislation that in our state, when you go to vote, you must come with a photo ID. Keep at it. You're on the right track, brother. Listen, leadership isn't about style. It's about substance. It's about action.
And the test of any American is not whether or not we get knocked down. We're all going to do that. Every one of us have. But it's whether we get up. Throughout the years, Americans have been defined by men and women who got off the mat and fought for their values. It started with the pilgrims. They wouldn't accept religious persecution in their hometown, their, their homeland. So they sailed here to find new life and new freedom. And then it continued with the colonists. They bristled at the taxes and the edicts of a distant crown. And they never stopped fighting until they won that battle. Generations of Americans have not shrunk from a worthy fight. In the 20th century, Americans have fought the forces of fascism in two world wars, the forces of communism in Korea and in Vietnam and the Cold War. And since then, our troops have fought dictators who threaten our vital interest in the Middle East and Asia. Right now, there are millions of Americans on the mat, not because of a foreign power, but because of flawed federal policies. Too many know the shame of going home to tell a loved one that they lost their job today. Too many have to tell their children they can't afford to go to college. Millions have lost their homes because the federal government and the credit rating agencies misled them into thinking that they could afford zero down. Who is it's going to fight for those people? Who is it that's going to stand up for those Americans? Not an administration that has made our economy crisis even worse, not a president who in the last few days has called our people soft, lacking in ambition and imagination were his words, who just Saturday night said Americans have gotten lazy. Mr. President, Americans aren't lazy and they're not soft. Americans do not lack a vision or ambition. We lack leadership in Washington, D.C. That's what this country lacks. The American people, the American people are not to blame for this bloated federal government that's out of touch with American interests. And for every American who's been knocked down by Washington's mismanagement, here's my pledge. I'm going to fight to end the IRS as you know it today. I'm going to fight to overhaul Washington, build a smaller, more humble federal government, fight to create jobs for every American that's out of work and won't rest until those who are looking for work have found it and they can have their dreams again. We've had enough of leaders who point the finger and say there's where to blame. I want to point this country in a new direction. I'm in this race for the presidency, not because of some lifelong ambition, but because the American people are yearning for a leader who will tell them the truth, who will put forward bold and visionary plans, who will not appease the Washington establishment, but dismantle it. If you want real change, if you want to overhaul business as usual, I ask you for your support. I ask you to caucus for me on January the 3rd. Let's get America working again, and let's get this movement started right here in Iowa. God bless you. Thank you all for coming out and being with us tonight.